Sure. Uh, my name is David Vandenberg, D-A-V-I-D-V-A-N-D-E-R-B-E-R-G. I am with um, Regina Green Ride Transit Network, and I'm the director of that student organization. And I'm, our organization, Regina Green Ride, is uh, running the UPASS campaign, so I'm, I'm the lead of the UPASS campaign. And I guess just maybe first just tell us what today's event is all about. Um, so today, the students' unions, um, URSU, is doing a, a town hall, they're calling it, to uh, get students to come and ask questions about the, the UPASS. Basically, it's just a, an opportunity for students to ask questions, question and answer period, with um, those of us who have been uh, running this campaign and who have been working on this from the beginning. And what's the next step after the town hall? So after the town hall, there is a referendum happening. So the referendum is on the implementation of the UPASS. Um, it is asking students whether or not they will allow their students' union representatives to uh, negotiate with the city to secure a UPASS for the students on campus. Uh, so that will take place March 16th to 19th, so next week, Monday to Thursday, it's an online vote. All right, and I guess tell us, um, I mean, obviously you're supporting the UPASS, haven't started this campaign. Why is this a benefit to students? Um, well, there's a few things that have happened recently, uh, in the past year actually. First off, the students have lost, uh, the campus has lost over 400 parking stalls uh, due to new residence construction on the north side of, of campus. And um, that, th there's been parking issues on campus for a lot of years and this has exacerbated the problem. Um, as well, uh, the city has implemented a 48% increase over three years for the bus fares. So last, uh, in 2014, a bus fare per month for post-secondary pass cost $53. Uh, as of January 1st, 2015, it has now jumped to $65. It'll go up until 2017, uh, where it'll be $78 a month. We're proposing $90 for four months. So that's the UPASS, it is a part of um, all students' tuition. This is not a new idea, this is not a crazy idea that we're just trying to implement here out of thin air. This has been implemented across uh, Canada, where 40 universities, even if we look just on the prairies, um, Calgary has it, Edmonton has it, um, Saskatoon has it, some, some closer to our size. Um, Brandon, a city a lot smaller than us, has it. Winnipeg just voted to, uh, to bring it in about four months ago. This is not an unheard of idea. Um, just to be a devil's advocate, let's say you're a student, you have a car or you live close enough to walk and they go, I don't want to pay that. Uh, well, for, to answer your second question first, students who live within one kilometer uh, radius of the university will be able to opt out of the UPASS. That is one of uh, two opt-outs that will be part of this, this UPASS. First opt-out will be students who live outside of city limits. Second opt-out will be students who live within one kilometer, uh, one kilometer radius of the campus, including those students that live on campus. Secondly, for other students who are um, other students who drive, there's a lot of ways they can still save money. One of the things that we are negotiating is a, uh, a free parking ride. So students will be able to, in, in, in areas where uh, transit is not necessarily fantastic, we believe there is transit deserts. If students need to have a car to get out of their transit desert and still get to the university, they have their car, they drive to a parking ride, park there for free through the UPASS, catch a high frequency shuttle, um, to the university. That way they're allowed to save $140 um, a, a year by just not buying uh, a parking pass. Parking passes currently cost around $320. Uh, the U pass for, for uh, two semesters, U pass would be uh, around $180 for two semesters. So students could um, decide to not actually purchase a, uh, a parking pass and still be able to drive their cars, park them, and still get to the university uh, via a short uh, bus ride. As well, the, in every instance that the, that the UPASS has been implemented across Canada, it has shown increased uh, transit usage. For example, uh, Saskatoon, they, they uh, saw an increase in about 40% in transit usage, which means that a lot of those students that were previously driving are now taking the bus. What that means at the university is that you'll see a lot more uh, parking spots open up. And in a day and age where the university is not adding any more parking uh, parking spots to campus, but they're adding 150 underground spots that students will probably never see um, next year. But other than that, there is no new parkade. There are no new parkades being built. There is no new expansion of parking happening on campus. So every spot is really prime real estate for students. So to get more students on the bus off of, or out of, out of parking spots is going to affect students who drive. It's going to uh, possibly affect students. What do you think there's something to say in terms of just you know, getting less cars on the road and having people be taking 
taking transit in general is a, a good thing, especially for students to get on board with. It's a definitely. big population. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Saskatchewan is, is still undergoing a boom, and our economy is largely focused on uh, car usage. So you look at a city like Calgary, which, is, which uh, underwent a similar boom like this, still a car-driven economy, they've spent a ton of in infrastructure money to, to allow those cars to be in the, uh, on the roads as a part of their infrastructure. And now, recently last year, uh, Calgary is spending $50 million to upgrade their transit system. This is, this is uh, we're trying to not be reactive, we're trying to be proactive get more cars off the road. Saskatchewan is booming. Mayor Fugere once said uh, that he wants to see a city grow up to 500,000. That needs to be done with transit. Other booming cities, uh, Empton for example, their 10 year plan is has front center priority transit. Transit needs to be a part of any growing city and this is something that we're trying to spark the city onto. Is there any challenges with the UPass? Is there anything that, you know, it's great if it goes ahead and students get on board? But is there anything that's like, well, this would be a challenge that we'll have to work with later in the world, like in terms of maybe access for some students or anything like that? Uh, well, it, it's, uh, it's an ongoing negotiation. So what the referendum, like I said earlier, what it'll uh, entail is allowing the students the student union to negotiate with the city. So first off, after the yes vote, we negotiate with the city, so that'll be the, the first step. But um, there will be continuing negotiations going on. Let's say after a few years we decide that it, it's, we see that the rate is, is too low or too high. That's something that the students union will have to uh, renegotiate with students. And what this really does is allow students to be major shareholders, primary shareholders, in this uh, transit system. Perfect. Anything I'm missing? Uh, vote yes, you pass. Thank you so much. It's fun. I think you mentioned that how much it was for the year, right? Uh, yeah, ninety dollars per semester. Per semester, okay. So, but I think I need to get in there. So, yeah. Okay, uh, my name is David Denver. I am, uh, I guess, one of the leads of the UPass campaign. So we'll quickly introduce who is up here, and then uh, I will talk a little bit about kind of main tenets of the the UPass as it's going to be voted on in the referendum, and then there will be opportunity to ask questions. I don't think we have a second mic, so you can either stand up and yell, and I'll repeat your question, or you can come and get this uh, mic, and we'll go from there. So. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Dippel. I'm the executive director of the Regina Public Interest Research Group. So for those of you that don't know about us, we're a student center. System? OK, we're a student center on campus here. Um, that focuses on social and environmental justice issues. So we do a whole variety of things. We give out funding um, to students, and we also run our own events around these topics. So we're here um, supporting the UPASS campaign as it fits with our mandate of promoting environmental sustainability on campus. Thank you for having me. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca Hamill. I'm a current student at the U of R here, and I'm also a former student at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And so I'm here to be able to speak to how the UPASS was implemented in Saskatoon. Hello, my name is Georgi Goichet, and I'm a faculty member at the Department of Economics. So my areas of specialization include public economics, development economics, but I want to say applied econometrics. So, um, so basically, so basically in terms of uh, recent experience, I recently graduated uh, from a doctorate uh, from Simon French University. So this was this is a university that has had a new pass, and it can also fill you in with basically uh, kind of an insight on how that system works and how effective it could be. In addition, I'll be able to answer any type of questions uh, how the effect uh, how do you pass could be an effective. Uh, Power to deal with the transportation solutions uh, that Regina is facing in a rapid and sustained population. Uh, so you may notice that there's a little bit of a bias up here, um, which is where all of you come in. Um, obviously, we're, we're speaking on behalf of the UPASS. This is, uh, this is not an um, event that Regina, the UPASS committee, put on ourselves. This is the anniversary. <laughs> Uh, event, Ursu put this on as a, as a neutral position for people to be able to come and ask questions. But there was no uh, there was no one who wanted to come sit up here as uh, a no side. So that's why we're asking all of you to, um, to have questions. If you have concerns, 
uh, that's what this forum is for, and uh, hopefully we can we can uh, look at both sides of the of the situation. Um, so I will quickly, I'll briefly give a overview of what the the U Pass is. Um, so the U Pass is a ninety dollar per semester commuting solution. I, I say commuting solution because I think it's important to get away from the idea that this is only a bus pass. Uh, the way that this has been discussed with uh, with Regina Transit as well as the campus uh, are so that the problems with commuting on campus can be solved, and with what's happening on campus, the only, one of the only solutions that's been actually yeah, one of the solutions that's been brought forth right now is this U Pass. So the reason that um, where am I going here? Okay, so let's start with this. Eight, sorry, ninety dollars per semester will be if you pass the in, Will be between seventy and ninety. Sorry, that's the the question. Um, will be put on to students' uh, tuition per semester, very similar to the uh, current gym pass. So whether you know it or not, there's eight dollars on all of your tuition every semester that's taken off that gives you access to the gym. Whether you use it once or a hundred times during the semester, all students pay that eighty dollars. So it's the same idea with the U-Pass. It'll give all students access to, unlimited access to the entire transit system, so not only the, uh, to be able to get to campus, but the entire system. If you want to use the U-Pass to get a free ride to the bar on weekend, perfect, don't buy a taxi. Um, but in addition to that, one of the things we negotiate is a, a parking ride, which will be free to U-Pass, uh, to all students via the U-Pass. So what that'll look like is um, students will be able to drive their own vehicles. So one of the main things is that we don't want students to think that you have to sell your car in order to use the U-Pass. That's why I'm saying it's a $90 commuting solution. Because there's areas in this city where transit isn't awesome, and I'm, I'd be the first to admit that. Um, we're not saying that the transit system is perfect. So you'll be able to drive out of your, uh, your low transit area, to a free parking lot, a park and park and ride, park your car there. There'll, they will, there'll be security. There will be snow removal. Um, students will be able to stay uh, inside. You know, it's currently uh, being negotiated at Connexus. Um, it's not for sure yet, but they'll be able to stay inside the Connexus Center uh, while their bus waits. And then you can catch a high frequency shuttle shuttle to the university. This will enable students, if they so decide, to not buy a uh, uh, parking permit. Parking permits are around three hundred and twenty dollars for the two semesters. You passes would be about one hundred eighty, so you'd be saving one hundred forty dollars there by simply using the U pass. Uh, sorry, the the parking right. Um, I feel like I'm talking a lot here. Um, there. Um, maybe a better opportunity, a better thing to do is just have students ask questions about all the details regarding the UPASS. Uh, that's generally what it is. The, it will be um, implemented probably fall 2016. So not next fall, but the, the fall after. Um, Regina, we've been in talks with Regina Transit. This is everything that we've discussed has been uh, with them as well, so it's not like we're just throwing things, we're not pulling things out of the air. Uh, it should also be mentioned that the UPASS has been implemented in over 40 universities across Canada. This isn't just something that we decided we wanted to do that we thought was cool. Um, it works. It uh, allows students to deal with the parking system um, by giving them more solutions, a multi-modal kind of way of getting to the university. And it, it uh, frees up parking on campus. At the areas where this has been implemented, usually there's a between 20 and 40 percent increase in transit usage. Uh, U of S, for example, has used this since 2008, and um, they saw an increase in transit ridership of 40 percent. But anyways, I'm talking about. We have a question. Um, so, what like, commitment do we have from the city in writing that we know how this is going to work out, um, or like for us students, as there's going to be how many? Millions of dollars into this from the students. So, what are we actually getting out of these besides this bus pass? Um, great question. So, the the power here is the students' union. So, what this uh, have the referendum question in front of you. 
What it is asking, it is not asking for us to implement the UPASS directly. It is asking for the students union to negotiate with the city. So what happens, um, Lynn, would you be able to read that? Mike. Mike. Okay, it says, uh, should the ERSU negotiate a universal bus pass, you pass, that will cost every student $70 to $90 per semester, provide unlimited access to Regina Transit and, when eligible, paratransit services for ERSU members in the fall and winter semesters, have exemptions for students who live within one kilometer of campus or who live outside city limits. Thank you. So, this puts the power with the students. So let's say that um, we voted in, we go to the negotiation table with the city, and the city says, you know what, we, are, uh, we, we can't do this for, for less than $100 uh, per month. Then Ursu would say, well, you know what, sorry, our students voted in a referendum that it has to be less than $90. Ursu can walk away from the table. This is not binding um, with, the, with the city at this point. The city asks that we get the yes vote first. And the reason for that is that in 2008, there was another referendum regarding the impasse. And um, that one was negotiated a little differently because the city actually increased service before the vote. And when the vote didn't go through, the city was not too happy. So they're trying to, um, to make sure they don't get burned this time. To, they don't want to put a whole bunch of money into the system, give a, the university a bunch of new routes, and then have it fall through again. So the, that's why the city asked us to do it this way, this time, where we get the referendum vote first, and then we go and um, we go negotiate with the city. But like I said, the power is with the students' union. If through the negotiations, it is not something that the students' union deems is of benefits to students as they voted in the referendum, students union can walk away from the table and say, sorry city, um, we're going to have to do another negotiation. Now, when you say that the ERSU can walk away from the deal if it's more than $90, they're not bound to do the referendum, are they? Uh, what's again? If the city goes back with a $100 deal, the ERSU isn't bound, they don't have to reject it because of the they can still accept it, right? Um, from what I understand of the, the results of a referendum, I believe that they are bound to those points in the referendum. They, they cannot accept the deal any higher than ninety dollars. Correct. Okay. And I can I can tell you that this this number ninety dollars wasn't just pulled out of the air. This is through uh, preliminary discussions with Regina Transit. Okay. But we're not allowed to publish those, or we're not allowed to um, until until we actually get the yes vote. The Ursu and the city are not able to sit down together uh, around those numbers. Okay. Is that clear? Uh, I'm willing to ask more questions on that because I know that is, has been one of the concerns um, regarding this uh, because people are wondering, okay, what happens from here? What uh, is this going to screw students if um, if the city comes back with something else? But like I said, the power lies with the the students union uh, on this one. I'll try to, if, if I can, give other people the chance to talk. But. Um, does the city have a like bus transit line item, or are we just pulling money to the city that could be distributed in other ways like road construction and other stuff like that? I got you. It's a great question. Um, it's a great question because in the past three years, uh, ridership in the city has grown by 13%. Yes. yes. That revenue from that ridership increase has not gone back into transit. So um, that's a very good question to ask. And I would hope that one of the things that Ursa would try to negotiate is uh, a deal with the city that a certain percentage, or ideally all of the money that comes from students would go directly back into transit. That is not something that we are, are voting on. That is something that would uh, happen in the negotiations between the students' union and the city. But ideally, uh, that would be a negotiation that the, the students here would want to make with the city, that that money would actually go directly back into transit differently than um, it is occurring right now, because it's, it's not going directly back into transit. Now. So leaving me on 
have a question um, in the, ref the referendum question. You talked about when applicable paratransit. Can you talk a little bit about how that would work and what that if applicable means? Yes, I can. Um, basically what that means is that uh, paratransit fees would be part of the, the impasse. So there would be, uh, for someone using paratransit, there would not be any additional fees to their, their transit. They would get the impasse and they would get unlimited access to the, tra the paratransit system. Paratransit, yeah. Uh, so on the Yes Vote uh, Facebook page, it's been cited that the park and ride program is a fact, a quote fact, but as far as I can tell, it's still in negotiations and does not exist in any capacity and there's no deal regarding it. Is it a fact or is it not a fact? Um, it is as close to fact as we can get it without this, uh, before this vote goes through. So there has been deal, there has been um, negotiation, uh, facilities management, and we've been talking to them about this thing is cut off. About creating this uh, the park and ride, and um, until basically the university and the city have both said that until the the vote actually goes through, the finalities of those negotiations um, cannot be discussed. So there's the, there's no negotiations. Uh, fine negotiations that are happening yet. This is all framework that can that will be passed over to this the student union. And in fact, this framework has been, um, been built with the student union thus far. Devin Peters has been very involved with this, um, so it's not like we're just some rogue students group that's trying to like negotiate a, a UPass on our own. The student union has been involved and is aware of all the discussions. But because of the students, or sorry, the the city and the university wanting to be, remain neutral, those, uh, those cannot be, uh, they can't be finalized at this point, so it needs the, it needs the yes vote. So is it ethical to present potential negotiations as fact, do you think? It, does that constitute misleading voters? Um, what, what, what exactly are you referencing? Uh, specifically the park and ride. Okay, like what, what, are face, what on the Facebook page? Uh, I believe it says fact number, oh, I don't have it directly in front of me, but on the, on the vote yes page, there is a, there's a series of facts. Uh, one of them is that there will be a park and ride program that will exist that will take students back and forth from the Disney Park and Ride. Uh, it will be included in the UPass. Yeah, let, let's put it this way. Um, fact, if we vote in the UPass, the students union will negotiate with it. Right? Negotiate with the city. Okay? Also a fact. If we, we negotiate, if the new pass gets voted in, we will negotiate a parking ramp. Do you know what I'm saying here? Like, as much as, I realize that it's like there's like cloak and daggers going on here, but because of the way that the city um, wants to negotiate this, our hands are tied. I'll, I'll put it this way. Regina is the, as, to my knowledge, the only city in Canada who has negotiated a, a U pass by making the students pass the referendum first. So that has tied our hands considerably uh, with some of these, these details. We'd love to say, yeah, X, Y, Z, this is all gonna happen, it's gonna cost this down to the cent. But the, the way in which it had to be negotiated won't allow us to do that. So um, yes, I do believe it's ethical because that is gonna be part of the negotiations. That is gonna be um, part of, the math is, is, is there. We, we've done the math, we know that it can be done for less than $90. So yes, I believe it's ethical, and yes, I believe it can be done. Okay, I'll yield for more questions. Um, my question is to the panel listener from Saskatoon. I, I think having an overview of how the system works in a different city would be helpful to all of us here. Thank you. Large question. Um, do you have any specific details you're looking um, for? Or? How, how, how has it helped to alleviate the parking situation that existed at the university before the university? I see. Um, well, it, 
alleviated the parking problems in the same way that we are hoping that it will do here in Regina. It increased ridership significantly, uh, bus routes did improve, uh, definitely catered more to the university students, and therefore, as I said, the ridership increased, uh, therefore uh, drivers decreased, and more parking spots were available. I'd also like to add to uh, comments just because I think myself uh, as a graduate student lived in Kingston, Ontario, as well as in, in Vancouver, two cities that have uh, uh, universities that are happily passing the pace. So, um, what you would see in those cities, cities particularly, for example, Kingston, Ontario, it's a city half the size of uh, Regina, and what you would see is, uh, particularly in the areas around the university, uh, is Basically, the transit frequency is about every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes. And I'm talking about something going back in 2005, 2006. So because this fee is, is heavy, so basically there's a high subsidy, so something in the range of 70, percent have never done that rates, but it's a very significant, uh, it's a very significant subsidy. So this gets to sway a lot of students, particularly those from, kind of, who have some financial difficulties, to opt to using transit. Having this large increase in ridership at the kind of uh, in a very short period of time puts enough pressure uh, on the city and through uh, basically and coming from the student union as well to actually increase transit service to make uh, to to, uh, to create some high frequency usage. And one thing that you would see, like even from um, uh, from cities where you would not expect there transit service. It's places such as London, Ontario, uh, Victoria, BC, you'd see bus routes running every five minutes or every ten minutes in the areas surrounding the university. So, um, now, the, so what is kind of, it, it's, a, it's a very kind of subtle, a subtle moment to have this uh, kind of simultaneous increase in demand for transit service as well as the city expansion. So both of these things have to happen more or less simultaneously. Otherwise, um, you would not see an expansion of the transit service. And kind of think about it, what's the alternative? Especially if you have a rapidly growing population uh, as we have in the journey right now. So what, so what we have is steeper increases in parking, congestion, a waiting list for parking, um, so, so, and as well as more time for gas because you have to commute longer. So these are kind of the hidden costs of actually of not implementing the U-Pass. It's not something observable; you don't get to see it. But that's the alternative uh, path to actually not adopting uh, the U-Pass. So um, I think that kind of in the last concluding sentence, what I'd like you to really think is what's at stake. Sure, some of you are not going to, you may not ever use transit, that's knowledgeable, and you may end up feeling that you're kind of cheated or worse off. But what you should get out of it is, okay, how much am I saving in terms of uh, less steep increases in parking and taxes for infrastructure down the road? So this is the relevant comparison between um, the yes scenario and the no scenario. Um, you guys talked about like allocating funds of the U Pass into other ventures of transportation on campus. Could you talk a little bit about the ones that are already implemented and kind of what those funds do in other schools that already have them? The um, sorry, the, the so, of funds. Um, yeah, just allocating the funds. Uh, that they are getting from the UPASS into other ventures of transportation you had mentioned. So other schools have done this, so what have they been doing with their funds? Um, about how the UPASS funds are out there, is that what Yes. Um, if, if I, I think I'm answering your question. Um, every university who has the UPASS, generally the, the major uh, things that they share are a, a fee applied to all students that will get them unlimited transit or unlimited transit access. So um, that that's usually the the base 
for all UCASs across the country. So there's never any surplus with that. It's oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. That's what, sorry, that's what I was trying to Okay, say. surplus. Yeah. Um, yes, good question. So, um, let's say... Um, okay, so we, we give the city, let's say, $1 million for, for each, or for easy uh, math. So the city says, in order to give every student on campus access to the transit system, you owe us $1 million, okay? So let's say that more students actually end up um, using it, so less students opt out. And we actually, from the funds um, taken from students, given to the URSU, it is $1.2 million that we've taken in. The students' union would still only owe the city $1 million. So what other uh, universities have done, basically what you're getting at, U of S, if they have surplus in any year, they put it into, I guess, a rainy day fund kind of thing. So that uh, after a couple of years, if they, if um, more students take, have taken transit than they, they expected they would, they, um, U of S actually sometimes gives rebates back to students. Or they could use it to negotiate uh, new routes or something like that. So if more students use the, the U-Pass here, then expected than, the, than the, the math that the city based it upon, then the city will not get any extra money. There will be X amount, and that amount will not change, and the students union will be responsible for um, that, that surplus. If we give the city around um, $1 million, it's a bit more than $1 million if it's for like 50,000 students. Um, knowing that the price of a bus is like around $500,000 and that uh, we won't like allocate 100% of the money to getting new buses, how can we improve like the routes, the amount of times like the buses come significantly in the first, I don't know, five years of this being implemented, knowing that we won't spend a hundred, like hundred percent of the money on buses, which would be like two buses per year. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and actually, the discussions that have been had with Regina Transit, there will be five new buses coming uh, to to deal with the increased ridership. So that's already a part of the the impasse. That's already part of the discussions that have been happening, as well as nine new routes will be added, or not routes, sorry, strike that from the record. Not nine new routes, nine new trips. Um, will be added to university routes in order to deal with increased ridership and allow students to not have to wait as long um, between buses. So that, that is, with, um, like I said, in 2009, there was a different set of discussions that happened with the city, and they're really learning from those and making sure that um, there are a lot of things in place so that those follow-ups don't happen. So they, the, the giant trends and the discussions that we've had with them They've already mentioned that um, the service would increase in order to deal with this, uh, in order to deal with potentially you know, between 10,000 and 14,000 new students using the system. So yeah, the money would not go um, uh, buying new buses, and the money would just be delivered to the city, and, and Regina Transit will make, um, they'll make their budget based on the numbers that they have, the funding they have from the, the university. So it's not as though the, the students, the students' union, are going to be involved in the negotiation how that, um, of, you know, that $1 million goes to buses or whatever, but the students' union does have the ability to say, yeah, we want to see increase in, on these routes, we want to, we want it to get um, down to 10 minutes between buses during peak times. And that'll all happen at the negotiation table and once, once again, if it's not possible for that price range, the students' union can walk away. So I'd like to just add to David's comment. So I think that the student union, in fact, representing 15,000 residents of Virginia, what it could do is actually pressure the city to actually utilize more effectively even the existing resources, the existing buses in the fleet. So for example, you have the number uh, bus like number 18 and number 21 that only run in the peak hours. So what can be done is run those those existing buses in the bus, Virginia bus fleet throughout the day and even into the evening. That by itself is a kind of uh, 
as a game. Basically, all, the only thing you have to do is, is, is pay for gas and, and, and hire a bus driver to extra hours. Um, and what I've personally witnessed in Saskatoon is that the city and Saskatoon Transit watch uh, which routes are being used more often than others and allocate buses accordingly. Let's say you uh, use a bus route that is frequented by a significant portion of the students, then they will make sure that there are the buses to accommodate those students and perhaps take buses from routes that where they are less used by students. Also, once we're at the negotiation phase, we'll have a huge bargaining chip with the city. So we can say, depending on how long a contract we're negotiating, if it's a three year or a five year, we can have asks for them every year to complete. So we can say, within three years, we want to see three new express routes from the top areas of the city where students live. Or within you know, five years, we want to see expanded evening hours so students can take the bus after their night classes. Um, so we, can, we have the power, once students vote yes, to negotiate for all the types of asks we want in the contract to be negotiated with the city. So um, we don't have to just stick with the very basics of um, the basic buses to cover the increase in ridership. We can look to negotiate for, for bigger things and bigger, um, kind of greater access to the university for students from all around the city. So. Um, Give, give another example of how um, students can be major shareholders in the transit system. At the U of S, when uh, the their review pass was implemented in 2008 for the undergrads, the transit the the route just kind of went by the university. It was just another bump on the road. But after the implementation and a whole bunch of new riders coming out of the university, the city actually rerouted um, their routes through the university and it became uh, a major transit hub, which increased. So many routes coming through the, the university, so it really allowed um, for students to have a major impact on the transit system for students specifically. Um, so the, these negotiations that you're talking about, the, the part of what we have um, in getting improved service, um, do we have that kind of that same kind of hold with fair uh, that's a great question, and uh, hopefully when this goes to Ursu, like, Ursu I'm sorry. like I said, this is just a student saying, Ursu, go get this thing. Hopefully that would be part of the negotiations that Ursu would be having with the, um, with the city. Uh, just when it comes to the bargaining power of the students in the rest of the services, now think about it. What do you have? on an entire organization, right? I mean, what's at stake is, does transit get $1 million or not? So, I think it's, uh, students would have a way more bargaining power through the student union, as opposed to being on their own as just one resident of the journey. So, uh, for sure, a stronger case to expand any services in the transit. to a minimum 4% increase in parking uh, permits for the next two years. Originally, they were trying to get a 4% uh, increase for three years. They shut that down because um, there's, a current, there's a study going on of parking currently. And from what's been shown so far, the University of Regina ranks the fourth lowest for student parking in Canada. Um, for student parking, and then the lowest actually for staff parking. So what that means is that we are very, very much below the national average. So when all this uh, parking um, 
study is being is, is finished. I would not, you know, don't quote me on this, but I would not uh, be surprised if you see a large, large increase in the cost of parking on this campus. The University of Calgary, for example, students there pay $368 a semester. We pay about $180, or what is it? Yeah, $160 a semester. So um, to continue trying to keep this parking system alive where we live and die by our cars is gonna get more and more expensive. The only parking that is planned to be built back on this campus in the foreseeable future is 150 underground parking stalls that are going underneath the residence. And as students, unless you're making bank, you won't be able to access those. Um, there's already a waiting list on those uh, parking, uh, those underground parking, and they're gonna be largely for uh, administration and whatnot. So the URSU and the, the university have also undergone, they've also done feasibility studies on building parkades on campus to try to alleviate the parking issue. And both the university and the students union have said that it's not feasible to build uh, parkades. So, and then you add to that the fact that in September, 605 new students are moving on to campus via the, the new residences. So let's, let's say that even 20% of them bring their cars. We've lost 400 stalls. We're not getting any back for students. There are no more new stalls that are gonna be built. And you have 605 new students coming onto campus. Parking fees are going up. If you think parking is bad now, it is only gonna get worse. So we have to start thinking of, uh, we have to start thinking proactively of how we can uh, deal with the, the commuting problem here and be able to, uh, to have a, a feasible option for students in the future, as well as uh, as you live in Regina. This is an option, by paying your money now, but by voting this you pass in, you actually can stand to increase the transit system long after you're a student. Because like, like we said uh, earlier, the um, students will be able to influence the, the, the transit system in the city for, for the better, and you'll be able to use that, that system as well once you're no longer a student, once you're no longer paying new tax fees. So I'd like to also add to David's comment, like, just give you some economic perspective. What happens, okay, if you have these people, basically, kind of, one thing that you probably know yourself firsthand is like, you don't get to switch from car to using transit or transit to car on a daily basis. That's, that's something that just doesn't change. Um, doesn't change. It's more of a lifetime decision or a long, very longer spending decision. I need to adopt one or the other. So now, think of all those car users that are in the city, there's actually a growing population. So right now, Regina is kind of the campus is kind of still in this kind of area where capacity is not being reached or is just about to be reached and it's at this point you're gonna face a kind of a fixed constraint with no expansion and only growing demand for parking so what economic logic dictates is that basically to make supply equal to demand and there are no waiting lists Basically, virtually the entire price, is, so basically we're going to see very steep increases, okay, without, uh, without an increase in infrastructure. So this is kind of what's forthcoming if, if car, car ridership keeps an increase in the presence of fixed uh, parking capacity. Now, what's, what's the alternative to that? higher taxes to expand on infrastructure. As Davis was mentioning, it's underground parkings and the like. They're far more expensive to build than actually, uh, you know, building uh, a parking at, at basically, at the road level. So, you, so these are kind of the things I'd like to, to really think about when it comes to what's at stake. I don't think a lot of people have touched on this yet, but um, the opting out of two questions. So it says on here, exceptions for students who live within one kilometer of campus or live, who have, live outside the city limits. What is that one kilometer? Is that directly or is that displacement? Uh, the one kilometer radius will be from the middle of the green. Um, 
There are heat maps that the university has that can show where students actually live in uh, circumference or sorry, radius from the university. And uh, obviously, there's going to be some case-to-case -case things that the student union will have to deal with. And, and part of the um, fees that have been negotiated include administration fees that the IRSU will uh, be taking on as you know part of figuring out these kind of questions. So um, yes, there's there's a map that's kind of flying within here. We understand that it's not a perfect system. However, the idea was that in 2009, or sorry, oh yeah, nine when um, it wasn't voted in, the referendum was uh, defeated. There was a large amount of students that said, "Hey, I live across Broad or across Los Canada in um, that area for student. The, I call the student ghetto, um, and I play. I, I pay a lot of money to live there. I pay premium so that I don't have to pay for a bus or pay for a car. So we we're trying to take that argument into consideration this time around by allowing um, some opt-outs in regards to that. Did that's your question. So, is it displacement or is it?" Directly along the roads. What do you mean so, by displacement? Uh, displacement, say, well, I actually live right across the lake. I mean, we have a big lake right beside the university. Um, do I count or do you count the distance along the roads to my house? Because the distance along the roads to my house is longer than if you went straight from the green and cut right across the lake. It is a radius, a circle drawn around the campus. Okay, so that's displacement. Sure. Okay. That's, yeah, that's the terminology. <laughs> awesome. That was from one of my other colleagues. Um, as an education student, we have mandatory internships in our fourth year, um, as well as some outcomes throughout the years. And the co-op program is pretty big within our university, uh, where a lot of students are working outside of the city. Uh, about half of us education students, half of outside of our city. Um, during those four months to do our internship, what are the options for opting out? Is there an option for us students who will not be using the busing services during that time, but still have to pay full tuition? Uh, yeah, the, for students who are doing co-ops and internships, they do not pay for some fees. So it's only the it's education students? Education pays full tuition for everything. Yeah, so tu tuition, yes, but it's uh, my understanding that uh, you don't pay the first fees. Tuition, yes. Every yeah. So, nursing um, education, and I believe social work as well. So, it's a pretty big part of our population. Do we have any student execs that uh, turn into student execs can talk about that? Let's see. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you, you de I know you pay full tuition, but there's not a student uh, a union fee as a part of that. So during your uh, co-op, you're not actually uh, a member of URSU. Okay. So it's URSU members who pay the fee. So students who are on co-op internship will not have to pay the fee during that time. And I know that one of the uh, implications of this that currently happens is students who are on their co-op internships in Regina and want to um, use their gym fee, for example, they're having a hard time being able to do that. Um, so I would hope that the, the URSU would be able to negotiate some opt-ins for students like that who are um, doing their internship, not paying for the students' union, so not paying for the URSU, the UPASS fee because they're not URSU members, but still be able to, to use it via opt-in. So obviously that would have to be negotiated. I have one more question for my Facebook page. Um, what if a student has a parking pass? Can they opt out if they got the parking pass? Um, no. So the idea behind the the free parking ride would be that you wouldn't have to buy a parking pass. Um, if students decided that they still wanted to have a parking pass, that would be their own decision, and it wouldn't be a part of the, the pass program. Um, I just want to ask about, I understand this fit up with benefits economically of, uh, you know, lower cost of infrastructure and parking generally throughout the city, and, and it's sort of been cited as a long-term benefit that students can enjoy. Um, realistically, are we not expanding the transit system and improving um, city infrastructure on the backs of students who are, you know, the financially, some of the least mobile and, and capable people in the city, um, for long-term benefit that as university students who may not 
heaven forbid, spend the rest of their lives in Regina, may not see the long-term benefit. Um, are, we, are we improving the system on the backs of students that really should be city council's job? And shouldn't city council be finding creative initiatives to, to solve a problem that is of their own making instead of taking it back to students to fix? Um, I, I think you bring up a good point. Um, what I think is more unjust is having a system in which we're required to own cars. Cars are incredibly expensive, and like I'm, I'm not saying sell your car, but how, having more options so that we could potentially one day I could get to the university without, I could get around Regina without owning a car. That would save me a lot more money than the $180 that I would spend on a U-Pass. So, um, as far as the argument of, of building a better system on the backs of students, I don't think that's the case at all because the current system that we have is actually a lot harder on students. And not having an option is, is actually costing you a lot more. Okay, so I'd also like to add to your comments. So, I mean, personally, being a student myself only until like six months ago, so I do empathize with everyone here. So. So, what a, so personally, I'd like to see much more, like, uh, much more uh, kind of substance going to more students. Um, and kind of the way you should think about this question is, okay, so if we actually have a student union and basically students from the audience, are they going to have a greater leverage? So, yeah, there's going to be some initial cost building post, uh, up to 70 to 90 dollars a semester. So that's the case. But the way you should think about it is, um, so first of all, you're not going to see those steep increases. Some of those steep increases could be coming in as little as the next two years, next three years, depending on, um, because based on parking spots are already at capacity, there's different costs. Um, now, when it comes to, when it comes to the student union meeting and negotiations with the city, so in this, even in the initial round, I think student union can do, especially if you're good at the negotiation, could get a lot of concessions potentially from the city. If you're by yourself, you're just spending for yourself, it's annoying that you'll get anything back. So even just drawing those issues as concerns, look, this is the percentage of low income students, this is the percentage of budget allocated on food, shelter, and transport. Uh, transportation. So if you just if, if there's just kind of institution to institution talking to each other about these issues, it's much more likely to have those addressed. Okay. This is this is basically um, what I think I'd it suggest is it's uh, so uh, the current outcome has great potential to make things better. Uh, we've been nudged by our CRO to say there's one more question, and that should be offered to anyone who hasn't yet answered the question, or sorry, asked the question. From there, I could either end up in Moose I could end up anywhere in Regina or any small town that has a hospital. So that's where my clinical comes down to. So I've technically taken my full-time schooling. I'm still paying for this. However, I will be able to utilize it as a student because I could end up needing to drive out of town. And so why should I be paying that price? Or how do I have a, how is a student, do I have, like is there gonna be, like everything we're talking about is, is the what ifs, the, these are the scenarios that could happen. But if I'm in school at the university where I could benefit from this bus pass for one or two months out of my semester, or not even, I guess not even two months, but out of the entire year for that fact, because I'm in clinical, I'm not here. So it's how do I benefit if I'm in Nustra? As of right now, my clinical is in Nustra. I drive out there, I'm out there for three days a week, right now. Um, but I'm also taking full time university classes, so I do pay student union dues. So where do I get to benefit from this bus pass? And this universal bus pass because I, or is there gonna be that option that as a student I can opt out for the fact that I'm not gonna be able to use it if I'm 
out of town or out of any range of being able to take a bus. Yeah, um, maybe there, that's something that the students union will have to look into for negotiations. Obviously, the, the nursing students are in a much different scenario than the majority of students on this campus, and uh, I think that would be a good reason for uh, looking at possible differences. If I vote right now, though, am I going to lose my voice when it comes down to the time of, when it comes to the final proposal, this is what it is? Am I now right now saying this is what my thoughts are, or am I going to be able to have that voice later on and say I don't agree with that because what happens if it doesn't happen and I do have to pay? Where do I? Where does my voice stand? It will like is this my final say right now on this referendum? I think that you can definitely still have a voice because your your voice can be heard through Ursu. So I think that Ursu, when they're coming up with the kinds of ins and outs, the opt outs, etc., they'll have to sit down with certain specific student groups that may not benefit from this fair opt out. So maybe it's they'll have to sit down with a special interest group from paratransit. Maybe they'll have to sit down with a special interest group from the nursing students and say, how can we benefit you in this system as well? So there's going to be very specific student groups that I think. If like um, that, Ursu will be in their best interest to actually sit down with and negotiate a good deal with. So I think that you can lobby Ursu, and then Ursu stands and lobbies for you with the student, with the city. Sorry. Um, so I think that your role is to really bring your voice to Ursu and say, I don't want you to negotiate a bad deal for my group of students as the nursing students. So can we um, include the nursing students? in some sort of opt-out process. So I think that's where you can be heard. I think there is a huge chance for you to be heard in here. I think if you vote yes, it isn't that you will be ignored or anything. You will definitely have a chance to be heard. So um, now it comes to the opt-out uh, cases. So we're having in Canada four universities that can more or less uh, can adopt to you pass. And speaking from experience, I'm aware that basically, basically each university has different opt-out uh, kind of uh, procedures. So it's not the case that 100% of, of students are included in the system. Okay, anywhere, any university in Canada. So, um, so having this kind of so Regina, University of Regina, uh, would have um, this huge benefit of all this experience of 40 campuses giving work through different solutions and basically seeing what's a good fit, basically um, what are the possible way, uh, what are the, the kind of the escape clauses of, 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 of achievements. So, because ultimately all of these, all of these universities have dealt with different municipal governments, different kind of transit systems, and uh, different provincial governments. And, they have, and the good news is that they've all come a long way in figuring out how to, to figure out uh, uh, and how to, to advocate the interests of those of, of those of those groups who look like they themselves. Yeah, last question. Okay, so earlier um, you stated the fact that a quarter of the students here wouldn't be able to secure a parking pass. Is the re how is this number calculated? Is it because of the number of parking spots available over the number of students, or is it because the number of parking spots over the number of students who apply for a pass? Yeah, we tried to get a number from uh, parking services regarding how many students apply for a pass and how many actually get it, but they were able to give us that number because at the university the staff parking and the uh, staff passes and student passes are together, they're not separate. So yes, that number is um, the current amount of students. Um, so for, we use 14,000 and I believe, uh, I think it was 32,000 or 3,200 uh, parking spots available, which is the number that we got from um, parking services. Okay, and my concern with this, or why are students being misled? Because def different students have different opinions when it comes to this. Um, with this whole mess, there's an issue being fabricated with this. That doesn't need to be there, a crisis. And it's involving the question of whether it's the number of spots available over the students or the um, I don't think it's fabrication at all. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, there are not any parking spots being built on campus. There are more students coming to campus. Enrollment went up this year. We are getting 605 more students onto campus. 
there is, this is not a fabrication at all, this is a reality that parking is getting worse and it's becoming more expensive. Okay, um, last question for me. What if the U-Pass is implemented and goes through and you have an abnormally amount, abnormal amount of students who decide to take the bus, what will happen then? Like, Party. That, that's, that's the plan. The plan is to increase ridership. 5,000 students, say. Give it a number. 5,000 students, which is increase the system? Which is a lot over the capacity. Um, actually, it's about 5,000 under the capacity. The numbers we've been working on with Regina Transit have been based on 10,000 students. And uh, the, the current bus, the, the plan for them to get five new buses and increase ridership, or sorry, increase uh, service to students, is uh, based on the numbers of how their system currently works. And with those new buses, the system will easily be able to accommodate 10,000 new riders. So never mind 5,000, this is already ready for 10,000 new riders. And you said that there will be a lot of new students come fall um, over the normal amount, and you're prepared for this. this is, that's the city's issue. So when we negotiate with the city, that is their job. So we are giving them a huge pot of money, and it's their job to, to figure out, do the calculations, see what the increase on other campuses has been. So the U of S is around 30 to 40% increase of students taking the bus. So they'll have to use numbers like that to kind of um, estimate how much they need to increase or how many more trips they need to take to the university and how many extra buses to add on to the road. So that's not our job, that's the city's job as the service provider for that, for transit. Okay, thank you, that's all. So I'd just like to add something from experience. When it has happened in Metro Vancouver, when you had those types of kind of issues, possible. Okay, it's not, so, so uh, what you see in Vancouver campus is not just students using the bus, it's faculty and staff using the bus. What was particular, what could be particularly trouble especially is the morning rush hour. When people cannot get to work and to school at the same time around 8, 30, 9 o'clock. The university administration went all the way to the provincial government and said, you have to find a solution with the municipalities and find buses. So what they did was did make sure, especially for their morning rush hours, that from tram, from basically uh, the subway system in Vancouver, there's there's basically a two-minute service with articulated buses uh, coming to university. In case of snow, what they did was that they had extra buses waiting in case of in case of in case of snow, kind of weather uh, related delays. So they could be put back into the system. And this is exactly what. You can have. You could have if you, if you have. Uh, it could happen if you have a lot of people using. It. The senior administration at the university will become very concerned. All right, we're going to have to wrap up. Bar would like to be open, but I'm sure these guys will hang around and answer any questions that you might still have. Um, I'd just like to remind you all that the Candidates Forum will be held in the Multipurpose Room on Thursday at midday and to make sure that you all go and vote next week, Monday to Thursday. Thank you.